Welcome to chapter 2.4, our chapter on sculpture. Sculptures, um, what makes sculpture sculpture is that they're three-dimensional, as opposed to the other artworks that we have been looking at so far, painting, drawings, film, uh, these are all two-dimensional art forms. You can hear my dog snoring in the background, can't you? Um, but, but sculptures can be made from anything, any material, glass, wax, ice, plastic, neon lights, animals. Uh, sculptures are three-dimensional. They occupy physical space. We can walk around them or become immersed in an environment. Um, approaches to three dimensions in sculpture. Sculpture can be freestanding, uh, or what's known as sculpture in the round. Uh, then there's relief sculpture, uh, which is the sculpture designed from viewing from one side. The image in a relief either protrudes or from or sunk into a surface. So freestanding sculpture is sculpture that can be viewed and experienced from all sides. So this is a freestanding sculpture. You can walk all the way around it. This is a freestanding sculpture. You can walk all the way around it and see it from multiple sides. Relief sculpture, though, however, projects from a surface or is cut into a surface. We've already learned these terms earlier, but we have what is known as bas relief, which means low in French. So it's a sculpture that is either cut into or projects just a small distance from the surface. Or we have high relief. Uh, which is when a sculptor chooses to carve more deeply, this creates what is known as high relief sculpture. It projects a considerable distance from the surface. So there's lots of different ways to make sculpture, uh, but primarily we have what are known as subtractive and additive methods. So in subtractive uh, method, a sculpture uses a tool to carve, drill, chisel, chip, whittle, or saw away on one of material. In additive sculpture, um, this is made process as a modeling, casting, or constructing, so you add material uh, to create the image. So carving. Um, most ancient works of art that still exist were made using subtractive methods. Um, most were made from stone or ivory or wood, uh, worked by chipping, carving, sanding, or polishing. So if you look in the image on the, on the left, this Hawaiian figure, this is made from wood that was carved, cut away um, to reveal the sculpture inside. And this is uh, a, a large head. Uh, this is about five feet, almost six feet tall. This comes from the Olmec culture located in Mexico, an ancient culture from Mexico who created over uh, a hundred of these massive heads. Some of them are up to eight feet tall. These sculptures are fantastic to see in real life. Um, they're made from a material called basalt, which is a fairly soft stone, but this was carved using Stone Age technologies, so stone on stone, basically. Um, so in subtractive carving, a sculptor uses a tool to carve, drill, chip, chisel, so in this case, um, a stone was used. Um, when we think of carving, we often think, of course, the great Renaissance artist, and in particular, Michelangelo. You might be more uh, familiar with Michelangelo and his painting, um, uh, especially his uh, ceiling of the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. But really, it's his uh, carving that, that he f had a closer connection to. In fact, Michelangelo never really fancied himself a painter. He felt uh, that carving was in a way more real. You're making something substantial, something three-dimensional. In fact, he... He believed that he wasn't actually doing the actual work, but instead God had embedded the sculpture inside the stone, and he was simply revealing uh, what was already there. And this is evident in the way he carved. And, and we know how he carved because there are some unfinished Michelangelo sculptures. Uh, he was going to create a tomb for Pope Julius II, but uh, they ran out of money. And this tomb was going to contain something like 30 sculpted figures, and uh, some of those figures remained unfinished. But while this sucks for Michelangelo, it's great for us because we can now see his methods. Most sculptors tend to sculpt all the way around. Um, so they would start from the front and the back, kind of moving inwards from the outside in. But Michelangelo is carving almost like he's freeing the structure or the figure inside. He would carve really just from one side as if he was pulling away this material, revealing what God had 
embedded into the sculpture. Um, this is an example of, of Moses from um, the tomb of Julius II, which ultimately was finished, but on a much smaller scale. Uh, but this would have been carved in the same way that we saw the image of the, the bound slave figure uh, sort of from the uh, from one side revealing the contents within. I'm going to have you guys now watch a video uh, about carving, so go and watch that. Um, wa uh, watch how the uh, uh, artist uses her tools and um, how she approaches the block of marble and just in general the methods that she uses. Take a look at that video and then come back. Welcome back! Alright, so now we're moving from subtractive methods to additive methods, where um, additive process is the artist builds up the work by adding material. Some materials, such as clay or wax, require temporary skeletal structural structure for support, called an armature. When clay is dried and fired in a kiln, it becomes very hard and durable. So, um, a common material used for modeling is clay, because clay is soft, you can squish it with your hands, you can shape it, you can add clay on top of clay, creating a, um, a, a sculpture. Uh, this comes from uh, the ancient Etruscans, uh, an early culture located in Italy, uh, and it is made from a soft clay called terracotta. Uh, but it was simply made in the same way that a child would make a clay structure out of Play-Doh or whatever, by, by manipulating it with your hands. Substitution is a form of what we call casting. Um, casting involves adding a liquid or a pliable material to a mold. Um, so if you've ever poured water into an ice cube tray and then froze the water, you've technically uh, made an ice sculpture. You have used a mold, you have cast a sculpture. Um, but first a model of the final sculpture is made. This is used to make a mold in which a casting liquid is poured. This is usually made out of clay. When it hardens, the, re the result is a detailed replica of the original model. So I'm going to have you guys watch another video on casting. Um, and you're going to see a method called the lost wax method of casting. Uh, this is used to make hollow metal sculptures. In, traditionally, in the ancient world, you would see the material bronze being used. So you're going to watch this video, and you're going to see how these sculptors create this. And then you're going to come back, and we're going to talk about um, this sculpture here. So go away, watch the video. Bye. All right, welcome back. So this is, um, these are two sculptures in the lower left. Two sculptures called the Riachi Warrior. We have a close-up over here on the right of Riachi Warrior A. These were made using the lost wax method. As you saw in the video, um, you saw just a video of a head being cast. And these, these sculptures would have been cast in pieces like that. Um, I'm not exactly sure how many, um, but... Um, you know, usually things like arms and legs were cast separately from torsos. Uh, this is a uh, amazing sculpture. This comes from the ancient Greek world. When we think of ancient Greek sculpture, we generally think of uh, white marble. Um, but this is a, a rather fascinating sculpture because it's made of bronze. And actually the, bro the Greeks preferred bronze, but bronze doesn't last. It doesn't has a, have the, not because it's not durable, but because it often gets melted down and reused to make other things, like building materials and weapons and things like that. So, um, a lot of ancient bronzes haven't survived simply because they've been reused for other things. But the Riachi warrior survived. Uh, because in 1972, a guy was, was diving uh, off the coast of Italy, and he saw... Um, a face, or I'm sorry, he saw a hand protruding from the floor of the ocean. And unlike me, who would have run across the surface of the water back to the beach, this guy investigates and keeps digging into the sand. And what he found was the result of a shipwreck. Uh, 2,500 years before, a, a boat carrying these Greek sculptures from Greece to Italy wrecked off the coast of a town in Italy, called Riachi. 
And these two bronze sculptures sat at the bottom of the ocean for over 2,000 years, 2,500 years, and were rediscovered by this man on vacation. And they're not only incredibly rare because so many bronze sculptures, especially large-scale bronze sculptures from the ancient world, have not survived, but also they're important let me, let me, um, because they... Look, here I am. Hey, how's it going? Um, they're also important because they're really intact. Oh, and there's my cat back there. Uh, say hi to Noodle. Uh, so they're, they're still intact, and this is, this is really cool because um, even sculptures that have survived tend to be missing parts. You'll notice that this sculpture has eyes. These are inlays. Um, I just lost everything. These are inlays. Um, made of either seashell or bone or ivory. And in most sculptures, these things have disappeared. They're, they've either been lost or destroyed or, over the years. Uh, but those remain, and so does the, his teeth, if you could look up close here. Uh, he is messing some weapons, because the weapons would have been made with iron and wood, and both of those materials would have long ago so just disintegrated. But... Um, these are remarkable sculptures. Um, the sculptures are standing in a, in a pose typical of ancient Greek sculpture called contraposto. And there's a spelling there on the screen. screen. Contraposto literally means counterbalance. Um, but it was used by the ancient Greeks to give their sculptures a natural feeling. Instead of sort of standing stiff and upright, they have this S-curve to their body. Um, one hip is higher than the other. You'll also notice that one half the body is sort of relaxed and the other half the arm, the elbows and the knees are bent. They're engaged. And this is meant to show the body in both states of sort of rest and motion. Um, it also divides the body up in a harmonious way in four sort of equal quadrants, giving a sense of balance and beauty, which the Greeks were kind of obsessed with balance and beauty and proportions. We've already talked about the golden mean or the golden ratio and uh, this kind of goes in line with the Greeks quest for perfection. It is also why the Greeks never sculpted people who are out of shape or who are ill because uh, every Greek sculpture looks, well not every Greek sculpture, there's exceptions to everything, but most Greek, Greek sculptures, classical Greek sculptures, tend to look like superstar athletes because they wanted to show the human body at its most perfect, reaching its greatest potential. Um, so here's a summary of the lost wax, but really the video is the best way to get an idea of how the lost wax work. This comes directly from your book, so if you want a closer look at this, it's in your, it's in your text. So traditional, pushing beyond traditional methods, artists have found other ways to enliven sculpture that go beyond uh, conventional additive and subtractive techniques. Uh, earthworks, construction, assemblage, ready-made, kinetic and light sculptures, installation, and on and on and on and on. As you guys probably know by now, art can really be made with anything. Um, it doesn't have to be limited to these traditional materials. Although a lot of traditional materials are, are, are still used because we know they work, we know they last. And some of the materials we'll be discussing uh, don't, aren't necessarily what we call archival. They don't necessarily have a long life. So earthworks and land art use the surface of the earth as material. Because of their enormous size, earthworks need the collaboration of many artists and workers. Uh, and many believe earthworks should represent a sense of harmony between nature and humanity. So... Um, earthworks date back, I mean, to the ancients, right? Think of Stonehenge, right? And the rock circles of ancient England. Or we could use this example. This comes from Ohio. This was made by an ancient uh, Native American people. It's called the Great Serpent Mound. It was made probably by hundreds, if not thousands, of workers taking mounds, uh, taking dirt and mounding it together. Um, this culture would not have had the wheel, it would not have had wagons, so it's very likely that things like clay pots and baskets would have been used to haul the materials. Um, you can see uh, it's the shape of a snake eating an egg. Uh, this probably had ceremonial purposes. It relates to the concept of life and death, 
predator and prey. Uh, eggs represent birth. Snakes could represent um, death. Um, you know, it's the circle of life, guys. Uh, this is a you know, very ancient kind of concept, and we see it here playing out in this large-scale mound. But um, we could look at other parts across the world and see, like for example, in England, uh, large-scale land art has existed for thousands of years. Um, this, uh, called the White Horse of Uffington, was created by pulling away the dirt uh, and the grass from the surface of the earth and revealing the chalky uh, soil underneath, creating this rather striking image. But modern artists also um, think about um, the earth as a, as a kind of a source for, for artwork, as a material to be used to create uh, images, to create art. Now, Robert Smithen um, belonged to a group of artists who referred to themselves as land artists or earthwork artists. We saw his, a work by his wife, Nancy Holt. We saw two works by his wife, Nancy Holt, earlier this semester. Um, the work Sun Tunnels and then the work at the Florida University uh, using the, the sun. Her, her stuff often um, involves the movement of Earth and the sun and the planets and the stars together uh, to create these sort of experiences. And he does something very similar. He creates Spiral Jetty, which uh, is in the Great Salt Lake, and it is a massive, it's like a, you can see it, 1,500 feet, it's like, you know, a third of a mile or so, quarter of a mile um, long. Uh, it is massive. Uh, so why? Why a spiral? Well, for Smithson, first of all, Smithson wants to use art in har harmony with nature. He's very much an environmentalist. He's very much an ecologist. And so this work is made to, ultimately, it will, it will erode, it will decay, it will dissolve. Because he doesn't want to create anything permanent. He doesn't want to create anything that will resolve the earth, but instead bring our attention to it, but eventually go back to the earth. He uses the spiral shape because of ancient connotations. The so spiral is found all over the world. It is found, as you can see in examples, in ancient Greece and China, uh, Ireland. I could show you images from India, the Native, Ameri Native America, uh, all over the world. And in most cases, spirals represent water, the flow of water, um, the ebb and flow of the tides, etc. And water equates specifically with life. It is necessary, uh, absolutely necessary for life. We can't have it without it. So this, this in a way, refers to the kind of eternal symbol of, of this, uh, of water. Uh, but also it, it refers to the scientific makeup of water, because this is the Great Salt Lake in Utah, made up of, you know, salt crystals. And if you look at this image of the salt crystal here, examined through a high-powered microscope, you can see that the pattern formed inside the crystal is a spiral. And so Smithson is kind of bringing together these spiritual ideas of, of water, of life, of sort of the eternal um, birth and decay of nature, along with this kind of scientific view of water, that it is literally a spiral that forms the salt that makes up the water of the Great Salt Lake. I think that's pretty cool. Here are some, here are some more examples of some spirals. Construction uses a variety of methods to create and put together components. This is relatively new. This came about with the invention of mass-produced materials like mass-produced steel and glass and things like that. So just in the same way, um, a building can be uh, constructed from pre-made parts, girders and sheets of metal and glass. So too can sculpture be welded together or assembled in uh, other ways, to constructed basically to create an image. So in this image by Nam Gabo, we see the artist has taken various pieces of steel and welded them together. Uh, to create a sculpture. 
There's unconventional materials. Um, Damien Hirst is a British artist who uh, deals with the unconventional, with deals with the shocking. Um, for uh, Damien Hirst came out of a movement of artists in the 1980s uh, in in Britain uh, that were known collectively as the YBA, um, literally the Young British Artists. It's an acronym for. And these artists wanted to shake up. They were kind of young. They were influenced by punk rock music. They wanted to shock the audience, their audience. They um, wanted to also become rich and famous and make names for themselves. And they would do these outrageous stunts that literally shock the art world. And Damien Hirst, more than any, I think any of the others, uh, created uh, work that was incredibly shocking, and it was meant to be. And this is his physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. It is a shark um, cut into three sections and then put into three separate glass boxes and held in formaldehyde. Um, this work of art was... Um, had to be remade, basically, because of the way the formaldehyde um, failed to preserve the shark. Um, Damien Hirst replaced the shark. He sold the image, he sold the artwork. Um, it started to cloud and, and, and um, decay, and he uh, basically hired another fisherman to catch another shark, cut up that shark, and replaced it. Um, so it's not even the original shark. It's the really the idea that he was selling, not the material. So why did he do this, though? I mean, obviously he did it because it is shocking. It is, um, it is something to see in real life. Uh, uh, just the kind of wow factor of this and the what the hell factor of this certainly is part of the reason. But also Damien Hirst art deals with, uh, with a subject that a lot of art deals with, and that is the subject of death. And in this case, you know, he, it's in the title, The Physical Impossibility of Death in the Mind of Someone Living. So why, what does that mean? Um, we're confronted with this sort of apex predator, right? A shark. Um, one of the oldest surviving creatures on the planet. Uh, um, um, a creature that sort of reached its perfect form, its final form, hundreds of millions of years ago, and it was so, it's been so successful, it hasn't really evolved much beyond um, the form it reached a long time ago. And yet, even though this apex predator, which is the most, one of the most feared creatures on the planet, which is a perfectly evolved killing machine, dies. And it is, it, it is fragile, and ultimately it can succumb to the same things that we all will succumb to, which is death. And seeing something so powerful and so strong reduced literally to kind of a, an object, a, 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 something that has been cut up and sliced and diced and put on display for our pleasure, is meant to, in a way, remind us of our own death. There's an old term, memento mori, a remembrance of death, um, that is, is common in art. You'll see pictures of skulls and things like that as a way of reminding us that we're, we're going to die. And that is ultimately what this is. It is a memento mori. It is a reminder of our own immortality. And we're confronted with it when we see something so powerful reduced to this, not only the state of death, but this sort of object that is meant to sort of shock and titillate us. Assemblage. Assemblage is the practice of gathering objects and fabricating them into a work of art. This is a work by Betty Saar called The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. Uh, this was created for an exhibit in 1972, and uh, Betty Saar, as an African-American artist, uh, wanted to use some loaded images, wanted to use some images that have negative connotations. And in this case, she's using um, these images um, uh, of African Americans that were meant um, to create negative stereotypes, um, and especially what is known as the Mammy figure, uh, a figure that is a, a sort of associated with African American enslavement, 
Um, and of, and you can see in this image we have this sort of mammy character standing with a broom holding a, um, a baby which she is taking care of and standing in a patch of cotton. So this of course all reveal all refers to the sort of antebellum South, the, the South before the war when slavery was still legal and she's these objects are not objects that she made but these are objects that she found uh, and uh, um, these were kind of you know objects that people would keep in their homes um, postcards and calendars and trinkets and things like that uh, and of course today this would be completely reprehensible but this was not an uncommon practice um, back in back in the day but you'll notice uh, that she has added to these images she's added a gun and she's added a fist uh, representing power representing change representing revolution um, so she's telling this story with objects that already existed by assembling them into um, a, a new format that recontextualizes, that changes their meaning from an image of, of servitude uh, and enslavement to an image of power and rebellion. So that leads us to artists who use objects that are already made. Um, th by, uh, this is pioneered by an artist named Marcel Duchamp, who we'll talk a lot more about later on this semester. But he argued that when chosen and presented by an artist, any found object can become a work of art. So art isn't about how you make something, it's how it's presented. Um, we use the term appropriation uh, sometimes when the object is altered in a way that changes its original meaning or purpose. And that's what Betty Saar did with her image here, uh, The Liberation of Aunt Jemima. Um, she appropriated these images and gave them a new context. So. Um, this is a ready-made made by Pablo Picasso. He took two objects already made, um, bicycle parts, so handlebars and a bicycle seat, and by reassembling them, he's created a new object, a, 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 a bull's head out of these previously ready-made objects. Sometimes sculpture moves. Um, we call this kinetic sculpture. Um, so kinetic sculpture can move due to wind, it can move because of motors, um, but it, it moves. That is, that is kinetic sculpture. Um, light sculpture. Artists, uh, since the earliest days of electricity, started to experiment with electric light. And um, one of those pioneers is a guy named Laszlo Mahalinaj. Uh, Mahalinaj is... Um, an artist who created these bizarre machines that use light and mirrors and um, metal parts to create patterns and reflections. And in many ways, he was sort of anticipating multimedia uh, design that we see all the time today. You go to big concerts and you watch st uh, performances, uh, mu music performances on TV, and you see the use of screens and electronics and projected lights and lasers uh, to create this sort of spectacular environment. And Mahali Naj didn't have that technology. He had simple sort of uh, mechanical, in, you know, mechanical parts and small motors and, and uh, you know, rather not very powerful light bulbs. But uh, he wanted to create these environments that would be filled with moving light and sound and shapes uh, in a way that we can easily accomplish today with, with digital projections and lasers. But he was doing this stuff, you know, in the late 1920s, early 1930s, really kind of pioneering sort of multimedia installations. Uh, and now, of course, we see this kind of stuff all the time, as we can see in Athena Tatcha's um, Star Fountain, um, where you can see um, her use of light, let's move in here, uh, to create a kind of um, kinetic experience uh, for the viewer as they watch uh, things, things change. 
Installations involve the construction of a space or the assembly of objects to create an environment. We're encouraged to experience the work physically using all our senses, perhaps by entering the work itself. So an installation is a work that we, it is a, a, a space that has been altered. It can be a room, it can be a gallery, it can be an entire, um, you know, outdoor area. The idea, the idea, though, is you are transforming a space to create an experience for the viewer. Uh, this is Anthony Gormley, a, a, a British artist who uh, created a massive work called Asian Field. He did this by going to different places in China and having um, giving locals clay, and um, the, these people would make um, sculptures out of these clay that were meant to be kind of evoke self-portraits. And then he assembled them together in an old abandoned steelworks factory in China and uh, created over 200,000 of these figures. And so, you know, in a way, you're supposed to be kind of overwhelmed by the sense of community that he has created because each one of these figures was made by a different person. And these people lived, you know, all over and, and did not necessarily have anything to do with each other or knew each other or communicated with each other. And yet they are brought together in this sort of communal space um, through, uh, through Gormley's work. And so you're not just meant to be overwhelmed by the massiveness of this installation, which of course it is overwhelming, but also you're supposed to be overwhelmed by the fact that you were looking at the work of hundreds of thousands of people um, who have no real connection with each other except the fact that they've all participated in this work of art. And, and it is through art that we can connect with each other. We can become a community, I think, is, is what this artwork is really about. We are now going to look at chapter 2.6 uh, on craft. So, what is craft? Well, during the Renaissance, a distinction came to be made between art and craft. And this is in the European and the Western world primarily. So this is unique to Western culture. And craft came to mean items that were meant to be used rather than simply looked at. So now we kind of have these two broad distinctions um, between art and craft. Art, or fine art, if you will, is art that is meant simply to be looked at, as something like a painting or... Um, a sculpture, or even a movie. Th those things serve no other f of purpose than to be looked upon for, you know, different reasons. To entertain, um, to educate, to convey information. Sometimes even, you know, the idea is that, like, something, you know, really f fine uh, can make us better. It can, um, you know, emotionally or intellectually stimulate us, uh, elevating our thoughts, elevating our emotions. You know, that's the idea. Whereas a craft is an object that is made primarily to serve a utilitarian, a useful, oops, a useful purpose. So, you know, the idea is that no matter how beautiful that, that picture is, it's, it's still made mostly to hold water or, no, you know, a, a piece of furniture might be beautifully crafted and uh, made with great skill and expensive materials, but it is still only a chair or a chest of drawers or that metal object that might have taken uh, months and months to produce, um, you know, a, a handle of a sword or, um, a, you know, an eating utensil or whatever it is. No matter how beautiful those things are, they still have a function. And that those two different art and craft can't meet. There's no overlap. You probably know my opinion about things enough by now that I think that is a load of hooey. That is a load of, of um, crap. Um, that is not, I, I don't think that's true at all. I, I think that um, there are some crafts that we are going to look at in this lecture today that are absolutely beautiful and took uh, a tremendous skill to create. And um, just because something might have a utilitarian function doesn't also mean that it can't be viewed um, as a source of entertainment, as a, even as a source of sort of enlightenment or self-edification or whatever it is. So let's, let's look at some basic crafts. We're going to start with the oldest, ceramics. Ceramics is made from clay. It comes from the Greek word keramos, um, 
um, it means clay. It, it, it is, um, you know, basically dirt that you can dig up and shape with the hands, and you can make vessels out of this. There's an old saying in archaeology that if you have, um, I'm going to move my little picture up here, if you have um, ceramics, you have civilization. And I, I think that is, um, that's, that can be very true. Um, you know, we, when we look at the great civilizations like China or the Aztecs or the ancient Romans or whatever it is, there's ceramics because you need ceramics for storage, you need ceramics for trade. So how do you make ceramics? Well, you, of course, dig up the clay uh, and then you got to shape it. And there's some basic methods for shaping ceramics. There's um, um, the traditional technique of coiling, which is, uh, we'll discuss in a moment, slab method, pinching, and throwing. So um, let's take a look. The pinch method. And I'm, I'm sorry guys, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to adjust this to where this isn't in the way. The pinch method. Um, this is one of the most basic ways of making clay. It's a process of squeezing clay between the fingers to push and pull it into a desired shape. Um, it can be a spontaneous and effective way to create. So, just like the image on the right, this was made simply by taking clay and shaping it and pinching it with the hands, right? And then we have um, the coil method, which is created by uh, taking clay and sort of rolling it up and coiling it with your hands. I'm going to get rid of this little guy over here. We don't need me. Goodbye. Okay. Um, and simply coiled, and then the coils are smoothed out. Um, the, next, the next method is slab, where you take slabs of clay um, by taking clay and rolling it out, flattening it out, much like you would, you know, pizza dough. And then these can be shaped into objects. They can be used in the, to form different planes of a three-dimensional form, as you see on the image on the right. Um, probably, when you think of making ceramics, though, many of you probably think of throwing. And I don't mean taking the clay and throwing it across a room, although if you've ever tried throwing ceramics, um, you want to do that sometimes. <laughs> um, so what is throwing? Throwing is using a potter's wheel. A potter's wheel uh, potter's wheels have been around since the time of the ancient Egyptians, around 2500 BC or so. We start seeing the first potter's wheel, and the image on the left is actually a recreation of an early Egyptian potter's wheel. And the, below that, you'll see a modern potter, potter's wheel. And the basic idea is the same, is that the wheel spins around, centrifugal force kicks in, and the, the clay starts to push outward as it spins. And then using your hands and tools, or your dog's paws, you can control the shaping of the object um, by, um, uh, by pushing against this outward force. The only real difference between the ancient Egyptian potter wheel and modern, potter wheel, modern pottery wheels is that modern wheels use um, electricity to spin the wheel. <laughs> uh, but otherwise, uh, it's the same. The ancient Egyptians would have kicked this lower wheel. It's, this is literally known as a kick wheel. So porcelain. Um, porcelain is a special kind of ceramics. It's made with a, a type of a clay with a chemical called kaolin. Um, it's a very difficult material to manufacture. In fact, it was invented in China around 2,000 years ago and wasn't common in the Western world um, really until the 1700s um, because the Chinese held very closely the secret on how to make porcelain. What makes porcelain so desirable is that it's translucent, as you can see in this image here, meaning that light can partially pass through it. Um, this um, means that it can glow if you put a candle inside or um, uh, another kind of a light source. Uh, but it also has, uh, whereas most other clays are opaque, meaning light can't pass through, the most other clays are tend to be earth tones. They're um, darker colors. They're browns and reds and yellows, sometimes even some greenish colors. Um, but this kaolin makes it white. It's also... Um, 
this ancient China is often made with actual bone. So you'll even hear the term bone China. And you'll hear the term China to describe porcelain because it comes from China. You might have heard your mom or your grandma talk about their fine China. And this is, this is a, a word we use now to describe very, very fine porcelain. Um, porcelain, like I said, was the recipe was very much protected, uh, and you know, in many ways, empires and rose and fell, rose and fell uh, on uh, the trading of porcelain. But uh, now, in modern days, um, we figured out how to mass produce it and manufacture it, and everything from our coffee cups to you know toilet bowls are made from porcelain. So porcelain is is no longer has these sort of elite status of a material as it used to. Uh, let's look at some other ceramic techniques. Um, this is an artist named Maria Martinez. Um, she is uh, um, a, a part of a culture called the Pueblo. Uh, this is her husband, Julian Martinez, and they brought back in the 1930s a technique called blackware, uh, which is an ancient technique associated with uh, native people of Mexico and the American Southwest um, of decorating pottery uh, using material called slip. Slip is a liquid clay. And what would happen is, is Maria Martinez and her husband would create a pot, usually out of, a co out of the coiling method, and then they would take liquid clay, this very watered down clay, and paint designs on the surface. And so, um, you know, we, we call this the San uh, Idefonso pottery, um, made by the Pueblo, or what are sometimes known as the Tiwa uh, people. And it is decorated with slip, and it is wood fired, or it is fired in a wood fired kiln. Kilns are really, really hot ovens used to bake the clay. Because the idea is you bake the water out of the clay and you make the object harder, more durable, pardon me, and more permanent. Um, but this being a wood-fired clay means there's smoke. And if you, if you fire the clay in a certain way, you can make it really smoky in there. And what happens is this smoke reacts to the two different kinds of clay, the clay on the pot and the clay on the slip. And if you fire it just right at the certain temperature with just a, at a certain amount of time, then you end up creating this blackware technique. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Um, it's, it's sometimes also called the black on black technique because you get this glossy black decoration on this flat matte black pot. So kilns. There are lots of different kinds of kilns. There are electric kilns, there are gas kilns, there are wood-fired kilns. And they all have different effects on the pottery, but the idea is that you want to bake these objects to make them harder and more durable. So typically when you bake a pot, a just plain old clay, you get what is called bisque ware. And this is um, simply um, clay that has been baked in a kiln. It usually comes out a pinkish color depending on the natural pigments of the clay. It can be a dark dark to a light pink, it can be almost red, or it could be almost white but not quite. But it's called bisque ware. And it's really fragile and not completely waterproof at this point. So in most cases you will glaze the pot. Glazing is made with silicon, which is basically sand uh, with pigments, mineral pigments, and some other s substances to bind it all together um, mixed in. And you paint the surface of the pot. Sometimes um, the color of the glaze will be very different than what will happen after you bake it, because you paint the clay and then you put it back in the kiln. And when it fi when you fire the, the this painted this glazed pot or whatever object it is you're creating, um, there's a chemical reaction with the heat and the chemicals in the glaze. And so colors can change. For example, things that will be painted on as red might come out as green because of the chemical reaction. So um, people who do ceramics uh, understand you know, the, the chemical changes that will happen. There's a lot of chemistry involved in the making of ceramics. Glass. What is glass? Um, glass is produced by melting silica or sand um, with lead at intense heat. 
Um, this is probably first used in ancient Mesopotamia and Egypt where there's a lot of sand. Uh, some of you might have seen the old uh, romantic comedy Sweet Home Alabama where lightning is used to turn sand into glass. And this is more than likely how ancient Egyptians and Mesopotamians discovered this technique. I am so yawny today. I wasn't yawny until I started doing this, of course. Um, there's lots of ways to make glass. We'll talk about glass blowing uh, here in a moment. Um, this image on the right is, is called faience, which is basically a clay object covered with uh, a glass glaze. This is from Egypt, and faience was used a lot by the ancient Egyptians, who were really the first masters of glass. Um, glass was also uh, created in the uh, Roman Empire. Um, this is a, a really cool technique of, called the dip overlay method, where you create one color of glass um, vessel, like a, and this was using a blue glass, and then you dip it in white, um, a, a white glass. And then when it cools, uh, you cut away the top layer, exposing the blue underneath and carving in relief the white on top. It's, it's a really beautiful and very difficult technique. Another kind of glass you might be familiar with is called stained glass, which is made by uh, rolling out glass into large sheets, staining them with uh, various mineral oxides, and um, then cutting those into smaller pieces and forming a picture, much like you would um, put together a puzzle. Um, although stained glass existed you know, well back into the 7th and 8th centuries, it was started to become really commonly used in the 13th and 14th centuries in Europe, especially in the construction of large, large cathedrals. And so when we often think of these big mega churches from the, mid, uh, from the Middle Ages with these massive stained glass windows, uh, the windows are held together, uh, the little individual cut pieces are held together with strips of lead called came or sometimes caming. Um, so the, you can see there's a little groove inside the, the lead came. Lead is a very soft metal. Um, it can be uh, heated up and manipulated with the hands and the glass sheets are slid into these little grooves uh, and then they're squeezed um, to hold the glass. Um, one of the most famous sites for uh, medieval stained glass is called Chartres Cathedral, which is located just south of Paris. Uh, something like 90% of its original glass remains because during World War II, a time where a lot of the stained glass, great stained glass of Europe was destroyed, um, uh, the, the church and citizens of the town took the glass piece by piece and stored it away until the end of the war. And so these windows are magnificent, guys. If you've never been to Europe and never seen a medieval cathedral, um, got what's called a Gothic cathedral, I, I hope one day you get to see them because they are absolutely magnificent. Because the images you are, you are seeing here, like for example, this is called the rose window because of its floral-like shape, is huge. I mean, this thing is 43 feet across. It's absolutely massive. There are tens of thousands of pieces of cut glass in here. And then these windows below it are about the same. They're around 40 or so feet long. So these are all massive. And there are hundreds of these kinds of windows all throughout Chartres Cathedral. And if we get closer, you can see um, how these are all just tiny individual cut pieces that are held together with lead. The idea is that uh, these are often Christian stories, of course, being told in these images. And when you're dealing with a population that was mostly illiterate, these stories, uh, telling these stories through uh, these stained glass windows was an important way of conveying the messages of the Bible. Uh, other ways to make glass. <laughs> no, these aren't weird instruments. You are looking at a technique called glass blowing, where glass is heated up. And, and gl when glass is heated up, it becomes this sort of soft lava-like almost material. Uh, it has kind of a putty quality. And uh, it can be shaped and formed. It can be poured into molds. It can be uh, shaped with tools. Or it can be put at the end of a hollow pipe 
which can then be blown into and spun, um, creating a form. Uh, this is known as glass blowing. Some of you might have seen this at, you know, Renaissance fairs or, or carnivals or things like that. Uh, probably the most famous uh, of the glass blowers and one of the most famous artists, period, working today is a guy named Dale Chihuly. Uh, Dale Chihuly uh, makes massive blown glass. Um, in, the, in fact, uh, the images on the right were from the Dallas Arboretum, where there was a show um, where they integrated David, D Dale Chihuly's glass sculptures in with the environment of the Arboretum, and it was absolutely magnificent because he creates these big floral type shapes. One of his better known works is um, located in the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas, uh, Fiore di Como. And this is in the lobby, and it is created, um, I don't know, with something like um, over 2,000 pieces of blown glass. Uh, there's a certain irony in, in, the, in, in this, because if you've ever been to Vegas, it's, of course, a uh, very extravagant, over-the-top kind of town, and it's built on gambling. It is, you know, a town, um, while there are a lot of other things offered there, shows and food and whatever else, uh, its major income is, is, is gambling. And, of course, gambling is a very precarious way to spend one's money. And I, I love the sort of the statement of this work. We have this you know, massive, you know, beautiful floral glass precariously dangling over the heads of whoever <laughs> enters the lobby of this hotel slash casino uh, with the idea that it could all come crashing down at any moment, right? <laughs> as beautiful and titillating and as sort of enchanting and enticing uh, as Vegas is, uh, it's built on the idea that you're going to lose. <laughs> uh, they don't make their money by people winning. So I, I like the humor of this of this piece as well as its beauty. Metalwork. Uh, metalwork was especially important in the Bronze and Iron Ages. Metal can be heated to a liquid state and poured into molds. We already looked at uh, some metal techniques in the sculpture um, chapter, but I want to talk about uh, hammering of metal. Uh, there's different ways of doing this. Um, metal, um, uh, what you're looking at is a death mask, a mask that is played, uh, laid over uh, the dead. Uh, this is um, metal that was hammered into shape or bent to fit the needs um, of the artist. Um, this is a technique called chasing, um, C-H-A-S-I-N-G, um, which um, means the uh, top of the uh, metalwork. Uh, metalwork was especially important in the Bronze and Iron Ages. It can be heated to a liquid state and poured into molds. Um, we've already looked at some metalwork techniques when we looked at the sculpture chap chapter. Uh, most importantly for us in this chapter, it, metal can be hammered or bent into shape. So there's several different ways to do this. This comes from the ancient Mycenaean culture, located on the Greek peninsula. This is a death mask. This is a mask that can be laid over, that was laid over the face of the dead, uh, probably a king or a high-ranking official. This was made with a technique called chasing, where basically the metal is laid over a mold or a form. So imagine somebody had carved, probably out of wood, um, this face already and then um, the a sheet of gold is laid over it and then it's hammered from the top to create this this face this design another hammering technique is called repousse uh, repousse is the opposite of chasing repousse is created by hammering the uh, metal from the back so chasing is from the front repousse is from the back um, fiber. Fiber are threads made from animal or vegetable materials. Fur, wool, silk, cotton, flax, or linen are synthetic materials. Nylon, polyester. You can also include in the uh, vegetable materials things like reeds and stuff like that. Um, 
but fibers can be spun into yarn, string, or thread, then woven or knitted into textiles. Um, this was created by a woman named Mary Linwood. Uh, this is an image uh, using a technique called cruel embroidery. You're not seeing a painting, but instead you're seeing a, a technique creating basically a, a freehand um, stitching uh, where uh, the artist starts with a piece of fabric and then they stitch an image into it using different color threads in much the same way that an artist would use different color paints. Uh, to create an image. And the effect here, I think, is rather striking. So in, you know, Western culture, crafts are often associated with women's work. And very, very often, women do not get the, same, the kind of credit uh, for their art in the way that, that men had. Um, typical traditional men's art, like painting or um, sculpture is often considered to be fine art, but art that is often made to be utilitarian, especially fiber arts, is often considered to be women's art, or craft, I should say. And it's interesting that, you know, we don't know the names of a lot of these ancient women artists, these craftswomen, um, even though, you know, they were making beautiful objects, since they weren't considered to be fine art, though they don't get the same kind of credit that men did. This is an artwork um, made with a combination of materials that's printed, painted, uh, but also quilted um, work, uh, uh, quilted cloth. Uh, in America, there's this long tradition of quilting that comes both as a combination of um, European and African traditions. In, uh, um, there, there's a tradition of what are called story quilts, where stories, oftentimes biblical stories, are told uh, by cutting out pieces of cloth and quilting them together. Um, the African American, uh, African American artist Faith Ringgold has kind of modernized that idea uh, with what she calls story quilts, which combine uh, traditional quilting techniques with painting, and these often are stories from her life or from people she knows, and she often includes text in these story quilts. So they're literal stories. Uh, this tells the story of a little girl named Cassie, and uh, Ringgold talks about kind of drawing from her own life, but, uh, growing up in a time of segregation, where during the summer living in the city it would get really, really hot, um, but the, she was not allowed to, uh, go, and her family were not allowed to go to certain beaches because of segregation. And so instead, they created their own beach on the roof of their building, and that is what Tar Beach means because of the tar on the roof. And we can see her family hanging out, having you know sort of summer refreshments, and uh, the little girl and her brother are sort of lying on a blanket in the way that kids would lie on a beach. Um, in many ways sort of making their own fun because, well, society has excluded them. But she's using the, the quilt here as a way of um, sort of kind of creating a family history because these story quilts and quilts in general are often um, passed down from um, mother to daughter, from mother to daughter, from generation to generation as a way of kind of keeping the family history alive. It's sort of a, like a physical... Uh, living scrapbook almost in a, in a, in a way. And, and in, in this way, um, Faith Ringgold is also sort of keeping uh, history alive, and uh, African-American history alive, by referring to the tradition of quilt and quilting, which dates all the way back you know, to the slavery days uh, up into this modern day as a way of literally, literally kind of drawing a thread, like a literal thread from today to the past. So I'm going to have you guys now stop and watch a video and then come back after this and we'll watch the second part, uh, the very last few minutes of the lecture. All right, welcome back. Now that you guys know what a tapestry is, let's look at a very famous tapestry. Uh, this uh, comes from the uh, early Renaissance. It is probably French. Um, it is a, actually a series of tapestry called the Unicorn Tapestries. These are located today 
in New York at a museum called the Cloisters. Uh, and these were bought by the, the American industrialist John D. Rockefeller um, from a Parisian count. We don't know a lot about the history of these tapestries. And except they were probably they were made by a group of women who are completely anonymous, who names we don't know. These um, you know women often worked, as you saw in the video, in large workshops, and uh, they're completely unknown. They're completely anonymous, even though the work they create is stunning. And, and I would say that a creation of a tapestry is something that requires a lot more skill and time uh, than say. A, um, a painting. Um, but this is a very famous series of tapestries called The Hunt for the Unicorn, or the uh, collectively known as the Unicorn Tapestry sometime. Um, but this is a, a, a series of multiple tapestries that tell a continuous story. Uh, we uh, have a group of hunters who have gathered here. Uh, if you look closely, um, you can see that um, woven into the fabric or the initials A-E. This could possibly stand for Adam and Eve or possibly refer to Anne of Brittany, um, the wife of Louis XII, who these could have possibly been made for, or perhaps another Anne, an Antoinette of Amboise. Uh, we're not really sure, um, but um, you know, if you think about these big tapestries hanging in a castle, uh, these tapestries were to serve two purposes. First of all, a very practical, pragmatic purpose in, uh, as insulators, keeping drafty air out and absorbing and holding the heat from fireplaces. But also they would have served as entertainment. These large tapestries uh, often told stories and they were incredibly complicated and complex images, allowing the viewer to sort of sit and stare at them for hours. And so the initials embedded in this tapestry, in a way, are kind of like a Where's Waldo sort of treasure hunt, where um, you know, you're supposed to discover the various AEs hidden throughout, not just this tapestry, but the entire series of tapestries. There's also lots of different species of plants. Uh, I think 101 species have been identified, but there's a lot to look at. Um, but this is a very common story in the late Middle Ages and the early Renaissance, a story of a unicorn hunt. Um, this served as, uh, serves kind of two purposes. Uh, in, in one way, this, ref this is sort of an allegory, an allegory for um, marriage. An allegory is a story that tells a symbolic story. Uh, but it is also an allegory uh, for Christ, uh, as we shall see. So the idea is that we have these hunters who have gathered for a, to go hunting for a unicorn. Um, they eventually go and find the unicorn. Why are they hunting a unicorn? Because unicorns are magical. Uh, depending on the legend, you know, they can um, heal the sick. They can even uh, grant immortality. The only way to catch a unicorn, though, is by having somebody pure. Uh, in the Middle Ages, this would be symbolized by a virgin. Uh, who can entice the unicorn uh, and then they will capture it. So we see in this scene our hunters have captured or have surrounded the unicorn. They have found it. Um, notice it is near a fountain. The fountain of course is symbolic of Christ. It is symbolic of baptism and purity. And so the hunters um, surround the unicorn and then they attack it. And you can see the, the unicorn, of course, is startled. If you look closer, you will see those initials all over the place, throughout. Um, if you keep looking, um, the story goes on and on and on. The unicorn is tries to defend itself. It even takes out one of the hunting dogs. But watch out, Mr. Unicorn. Bad things are about to happen. Ooh, look out. <laughs> Um, the unicorn is eventually, though, enticed by a virgin, where it is finally finished off. So virgins are, of course, associated with purity, um, associated with the Virgin Mary, associated with Christ. Um, but this is also, in many ways, a reference to a young bride. Um, as we shall see, the marriage allegory continues. Oops. 
Um, the unicorn is eventually slain, where it is brought into the, the castle and the palace, and then it is magically resurrected. And the unicorn does not die, but its life is eternal. Uh, so, of course, this is a representation of Christ, um, who is persecuted, who is crucified, and then who is reborn, who's re resurrected. So the unicorn could be read on that level. Like I said, it can also be uh, referred to as an allegory for marriage. The virgin represents the young bride. The unicorn is sort of the specialness of the union of the marriage. And if you look closely, you'll see that there is a chain um, chaining the unicorn to this tree. And this, of course, represents the bonds of marriage, the bonds of matrimony. So we have here an image that is incredibly complex because of the layers of allegory. We have a Christian allegory. Um, we have an allegory about marriage. And then we also have just an adventure story of a fun, exciting story about hunters um, capturing and hunting down this incredibly powerful and magical mythological beast. But keep in mind that, once again, this image was made by weaving threads together to form this incredibly complicated image. And it was done by a, a series of, of, of women who are completely unknown and anonymous to us today. Okay, that wraps it up for our chapter on craft. See you next time.